Today, I want to offer an introduction to the book of Judges, Sefer Shoftim. This is a complex and quite upsetting book. I certainly can't address all of the issues of this book in one introductory session, but I want to offer a general outline and approach to the book. The book of Judges is broadly divided into three parts. The first two and a half chapters from Perak Aleph through Perak Gimel Pasuk Vav offer a long introduction to the book, which anticipates and lays the groundwork for understanding the book's failures. The, the middle part of the book, chapters 3 through 16, constitute the main body of the book. There we encounter the stories of the 12 judges, the 12 leaders of the book. What's surprising are the final five chapters of the book, chapters 17 through 21. These chapters are leaderless. There are no judges in these chapters. There are no leaders at all. Now, even though there's some controversy among the commentators as to the chronology of these chapters, from a purely literary perspective, they're very clearly the epilogue to the book, and they seem to illustrate the chaotic and disastrous outcome of the Book of Judges. This is surprising primarily because, I mean, the, the upsetting nature of the Book of, of Judges is surprising, primarily because it continues the Book of Joshua. The Book of Joshua describes Am Yisrael's, Israel's initial entrance into the land, the conquest, and the beginning of settlement. It's an exciting and optimistic book. It's marked by social unity, by harmony between the people, between their leader, Yehoshua, and God. The book of Judges follows that period, describing the actual settlement of the land. But in contrast to the book of Yehoshua, the book of Judges portrays a catastrophic period, one that rapidly spins out of control, winding up with a stone-like story of an inhospitable and brutal society. The book of Judges then ends with a civil war, with a society that is on the verge of collapse. It seems that this is the end of Am Yisrael's attempt to set up nationhood in the land. How did it come to this? To understand the book of Judges, we have to try to comprehend how this period goes so terribly awry. What specifically goes wrong in the book of Judges that causes the nation society to unravel? Now, as you read through the book, it appears that basically everything goes wrong. Religiously, socially, militarily, politically. The people don't fully rid the country of the idolatrous Canaanites, and they begin to worship their idols, the idols of the Canaanites, the idols that they were supposed to uproot from the land. The separate tribes never coalesce into a unified nation. Unity breaks down. Enemies invade Israel in rapid succession, oppressing and ruling Israel. And repeatedly what we see in the book is that the leaders, the judges, they emerge for a brief period just to take care of a specific problem. And then they disappear again, leaving a vacuum of leadership until the next disaster arises. The cycle of the book of Judges is well known. Israel sins, followed by God sending an enemy as a punishment for those sins. This is followed by the people's cries to God, by the people's repentance, which is then followed by God sending a judge to save them. And this cycle occurs over and over. It is a negative and seemingly endless cycle. But you know what's even worse than this cycle? Worse than this cycle is the possibility that the cycle will not continue. At least while the cycle endures, we see God responding to the people's cries. But as the book progress progresses, the cycle begins to break down. God is increasingly reluctant to send them a judge in response to their cries. This suggests that God's patience with his nation's betrayals is beginning to wane. Look at what happens in chapter 10 in Perak Yud. 
not even halfway through the book. What we see is, is that the first three parts of the cycle are in place as expected. Perik Yud Pasuk Vav tells us, Vayosifu b'nei Yisrael lasot hara b'nei Hashem. Am Yisrael continue to do what is bad in the eyes of God. Vayavdu et ha-be'alim ve'et ha-ashtarot ve'et Elohei Aram ve'et Elohei Tzidon ve'et Elohei Moav ve'et Elohei Vnei Amon ve'et Elohei Plishtim Vayazvu et Hashem ve'lo avaduhu. Right? They're worshiping all of the different gods in the land and they abandon God and they no longer serve God. Of course, this is followed by God's anger and God sending them the plishtim and Amon to punish them. In Pasuk Yud, we have the third part of the cycle, Vayiz'aku b'nei Yisrael el Hashem lemor chatanu lach. Am Yisrael cry out to God and they say, we have sinned before you. And so we have the first three parts of the cycle, sins, punishment, and Am Yisrael's cry and repentance. But now what's critical is to look at God's response. We expect God now to send them a savior. But what in fact does God say? Vayomer Hashem el b'nei Yisrael, halo mi Mitzrayim, umin ha'emori, umin b'nei Amon, umin plishtim v'tzidonim v'amalek, umaon lachatzu etchem, v'tizakku elai, v'oshi etchem miyadam. All these people were oppressing you, Mitzrayim, Amori, Amon, Plishtim, Tzidonim, etc. And you cried out to me, and I saved you over and over. Ve'atem, azavtem oti, v'ta'avdu Elohim acherim. And you abandoned me, and you served other gods over and over. Lachem, lo osif lo shiatchem. Therefore, I will not continue to save you. Lechu v'zaku el ha'elohim asher b'chartem bam heim ha'yoshiu lachem b'eit saratchem. Go and cry out to the gods that you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your troubles. This suggests the breakdown of the cycle. The situation has deteriorated. God is not necessarily going to keep sending them a savior. And as we noted previously, the final five chapters of the book, chapters 17 through 21, lack leadership entirely. No judge appears, the situation spirals out of control, and anarchy leads to chaos. The final pasuk in the book tells us that there was no king of Israel in this time. Each person did whatever was right in his eyes. And what was right in their eyes at this time? Theft idolatry, menacing and tyrannical behavior, the collective rape of a concubine, indifference toward the dignity, the needs, and the rights of others, civil war. The book of Judges concludes with the utter breakdown of moral and religious behavior. How does this occur? Where do things go so terribly wrong? This, in my mind, is the critical question that we have to understand, to understand the book of Judges and to correct the book of Judges. It is difficult, however, to pinpoint exactly what sets in motion the deteriorating situation. One could claim that it's the religious problems that lead to the breakdown of national unity. Perhaps it's the leadership problems that lead to the religious and social breakdown. Perhaps it, it starts with the breakdown of social unity, which leads to the religious problem. And there's no doubt that religious, social, military leadership problems in the book are connected. They interlock, they mingle, they create this tangled cycle of disrepair in which religious problems are exacerbated by the social problems, and the social problems are exacerbated by the religious problems. Just to offer one example of how these different spheres come together, consider the following. You know, it seems that the nation completely ne neglects the Mishkan, the tabernacle, during this period. In fact, the Mishkan is not mentioned in the book at all until the very end of chapter 18. And there only as a side point, while discussing the house of idolatry that is set up for the idol of Micha. 
the people seem to neglect the Mishkan. And once the nation no longer goes to the Mishkan three times a year, the nation loses their social cohesion. They no longer feel connected to one another. And yet, it seems to me that the book does indicate to us the primary factor, the, the, the problem that sets the downward spiral in motion. It's really important to identify this factor if we want to understand how to repair the problems of the book. And to see it, I think we have to look at the very beginning of the book of Judges, at the first two psukim, which begin, Vayhi acharei mot Yehoshua, and it was after the death of Yehoshua. Vayishalu b'nei Yisrael b'Hashem lemar, mi yale lanu el haknani b'tchila lihilachem bo. Am Yisrael turns to God and says, who will lead us in our upcoming battle? Who will lead us to fight the Kananim? Vayomer Hashem, Yehuda, Yaale. Yehuda will lead you. The book of Judges opens with the problem of leadership. This is the first time in Israel's history that the nation must scramble to figure out leadership. Moshe in Egypt was chosen by God. And after him, he appoints Yahushua as the leader before he dies. At God's behest and before the eyes of the nation, there is no question who Moshe's successor is. The question arises, really, why doesn't Yahushua appoint a successor? Now, at first glance, this seems to constitute an irresponsible omission on the part of Yahushua. And yet, when we look at God's answer, we can perhaps surmise that Yahushua had a very good reason for not appointing a successor. Note that God does not point to an individual. He doesn't say, Otniel ben Kenaz shall lead. Ehud ben Geira shall lead. No, he points to a tribe, Yehuda Yale. And this tribe happens to be the tribe designated to produce the monarchy. Now, according to many commentators, Israel's first task after they enter the land is to set up a monarchy. The Rambam says at the beginning of Hilchot Melachim, and he quotes this from Sanhedrin, Shalosh mitzvot nitzdavu Yisrael b'sha'at knisatan la'aretz. Three commandments. Am Yisrael was commanded when they entered the land. The first one, limnot lahem melech, to appoint for themselves a king. Yehoshua may not appoint a leader because the time has come for the people to set up kingship. This is a very significant conversation between God and the nation. They ask for a leader, and God points to the tribe of kingship. You know, as evidence for the significance of this conversation and its importance for the book of Judges, we have to note that the very same conversation appears at the end of the book, in the midst of the worst crisis that a society can experience civil war. If you look at the very end of the book, in chapter 20, during the course of the civil war, the nation asks God a question. Again, it's a question of leadership. Of course, ironically here, it's leadership in battle against members of their own nation. Vayomru b'nei Yisrael, am Yisrael, turn to God in perek kaf pasuk yudchet and say, mi yale lanu batchila? La milchama in b'nei vinyamin. Who will lead us into battle against the tribe of Benjamin? Vayomer Hashem, Yehuda v'tchila. It's the same question and answer. This suggests that had the nation listened to God at the very beginning of the book and turned to the tribe of Yehuda to lead them to set up the monarchy, they would not be in the current situation in which they find themselves at the end of the book. 
they should have understood from God's initial answer that the time has come to set up a monarchy. But they don't. This is the beginning of the problem of this period. And another piece of evidence that this is really the initial problem of the period is found in the final five chapters of the book, where the absence of monarchy becomes the refrain that explains the calamity of these chapters. These chapters, as we said before, they have no leader, they have no judge, they have no order, and they describe a period of utter religious and social disarray. And the refrain that appears over and over through these five chapters is, Bayamim hahim ein melech b'Yisrael. In these days, there's no king in Israel. This is what leads us to the final disastrous verse of the book. The final pasuk in the book of Judges, Bayamim Ahem, Ein Melech B'Yisrael, Ish Hayashar Be'inav Yaseh. In these days, there is no king of Israel. Instead, there is utter chaos. How were the, spe- the people supposed to know to set up a monarchy? I think that that is what God is telling them at the very beginning of the book. Even if the Tanakh is wary of kingship, and in fact, any strong leadership. That is what is needed at this time, with, of course, the proper limitations on the king as designated in Devarim, Perak Yud Zayin, in the 17th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. There we have all the limitations on the power of the king. But at this time, we need a powerful king. The nation of 12 separate tribes is, for the first time, separated geographically in their own country. They need stable, dynastic, and robust leadership in order to make it work. And this is the first mistake in the book, which instead of establishing a monarchy, features individual leaders from different tribes. It appears that as the book progresses, leadership gets progressively less effective, and the situation continues to unravel. Now, you could read the book of Judges. Some uh, some people actually read the book of Judges as a series of ups and downs, right? Periods that get better with the arrival of each judge and then plunges downward when each judge dies, only to go up again when a new judge arrives on the scene. I think that the book portrays a steady decline. I would actually draw it as a series of downward plunges a step-like structure in which each judge is less effective than the one before them. And as we progress, we see it in a lot of different arenas. First of all, we see that the judges have increasingly limited geographical scope of leadership. And as the book progresses, the battle becomes less national and more tribal. Each judge becomes less and less effective in his ability to gather broad support from the nation for his battles. Think of Dvorah calling the tribes to battle who don't come. Think of Gideon who tries to get the people of Sukkot and Penuel to contribute food to his troops. Think of Shimshon, who is thwarted by the people of Yehuda. As the book progresses, the judges become less effective, and it's increasingly difficult to find a leader. I think that this may be what is indicated by the um, kind of regular appearance of the minor judges in the book. The minor judges are the judges about whom we have no actual story. There are six judges that we have a story about and six that we really have no story about them at all. And they appear scattered throughout the book in groups. And these groups appear in steadily increasing numbers. So that the first time that we have the appearance, the appearance of this minor figure, it's just one, Shamgar ben Anat, who appears between the leadership of Ehud ben Gera and Devora. Between Gideon and Yiftach, we have two minor judges, Tola ben Pua and Yair Hagiladi. Between the second to last and the last judge, Yiftach and Shimshon, we have three minor judges, Ivtsan, Elon Hazvuloni, 
and Avdon ben Hillel haparotoni. And it's as though each time that we have these, these minor judges, the people are searching for leadership. And there's a hiatus, a dearth of leadership, which gets longer and longer, where the minor judges come in to kind of fill the blank of the dearth of leadership. The other way in which we see the deterioration of the leaders is that the leaders themselves begin to show signs of questionable religious commitment. We see Gideon asking for signs from God. We see Yiftach making a problematic vow. We see Shimshon in the stories of his relationships with women. We see that the absence of monarchy means that the leadership begins to deteriorate. There is no centralized dynastic institution which can ensure authority and stability. And I think in the book, this leads to two major consequences, social failure and religious failure. The failure of leadership leads to the failure to properly uproot the Canaanites, which causes the people to start worshiping idols, which causes the people actually to intermarry with these Canaanites. The failure of leadership also leads to social fracture, the failure of one tribe to help the other, an increasing sense of primary loyalty to one's own tribe and family, infighting, and eventually, full-blown civil war. Now, I deliberately leave aside here the military problems because they're presented as a punishment by God, a consequence of Israel's failures. And so what we emerge with in the book of Judges is a triangle, a triangle in which leadership is at the top of the deterioration of the failures, and it leads to two separate failures. One failure is the social failure, and the other is the religious failure. And then, as I said before, they all intermingle and influence each other. But the book of Judges tells us that leadership is the original problem. The final section of the book of Judges, chapters 17 through 21, again brings this triangle together. The themes of deterioration emerge in these final five chapters, which, as we said before, are completely leaders, leaderless, marked by the refrain, there was no king of Israel during this time. What is the result of the lack of monarchy in these final chapters? Well, these chapters divide into two separate stories. Chapters 17 through 18 is the story of Micha's idol, the idolatrous shrine that is built by Micha because of his theft. And eventually, this idol is stolen from him and constructed as part of a shrine by the tribe of Dan. That's the first story. The second story is the one that occurs in chapters 19 through 21. It is a stone-like story, as we mentioned before, a story that tells of the collective rape of the concubine and eventually spirals outward into civil war. Each of these stories emphasizes a different failure, which is caused by the absence of leadership, which is caused by the absence of monarchy. Chapters 17 through 18 tells us, uh, tell us of the religious unraveling of the nation. It's the story of idolatry. It's the story of a warped tribal attempt to conquer the land of Israel. It's the story of setting up priests who are not priests over an idolatrous shrine, which has been constructed as an alternative to the Mishkan, to the tabernacle. Chapters 19 through 21 tell us the story of the social breakdown of the nation of Israel, the story of lack of hospitality, the objectification of the other, and civil war. Now, once we identify the way that society falls apart in the book of Judges, we can begin 
to search for the way in which it is repaired. I believe that the repair of the period of the judges begins in the book of Root. The book of Root, of course, occurs bimei shvot shoftim during the period of the judging of the judges, and it appears to be the solution to the problem. Of course, if you look in the very last pasuk of the book of Root, we see that the end of the book of Root ends with the birth of David. This is a contrast to the final words of the book of Judges, Ein melech bi Israel. therefore everyone did whatever was right in their eyes because there was no king. The book of Ruth concludes with the birth of the Davidic dynasty, with the monarchy in our sights. And how do we get there? We get there because the book of Ruth features a man from the tribe of Yehuda, who seems to be the fulfillment of God's initial instructions, both at the beginning and at the end of the book of Judges, Yehuda Ya'aleh. When we look at the description of Boaz towards the end of the book of Ruth, as he comes forward to fulfill his obligations toward the family of Naomi, to act as the primary figure and leader in the book. Root Perek Dalid, chapter 4, verse 1, begins, Uvoaz Allah Hashar. Boaz went up to the gate. Yehuda Ya'ale, our Judean leader, rises to fulfill that role that God had designated him to fulfill. And more to the point, Boaz our Judean leader during the period of the judges acts as a leader. He leads the people, both in terms of his religious behavior, his righteousness, and his social behavior, the way in which he interacts with Root. This Judean figure who assumes leadership ultimately launches the monarchy, setting in motion the hoped-for solution to the disaster of the Book of Judges.